That was beautiful. We're going to get a chance to sing our version of it later in the service. Tis the season, tis the season with all that the season brings. I'm going to begin a little lightly and then change the mood. On November 1st of this year, the Washington Post offered a preview of this year's Starbucks holiday-themed cups, <laughs> asking whether this year's design will attract controversy, as they have in previous years. You may remember that in 2015, Starbucks' simple red cup design was accused of being anti-Christian, and that last year, their festive cup design, which I rather liked, was accused of, quote, promoting the gay agenda. <laughs> Therefore, the November 1st Washington Post piece, hard-hitting investigative journalism, <laughs> researching all that went in to designing this year's coffee cup. I only bring this up to observe that an awful lot of people seem to have an awful lot of emotional energy around this time of the year, and especially on whether people are observing the season correctly. And please don't think I'm only pointing a finger at cultural conservatives who believe that there is a war on Christmas afoot. After all, I confess that I too can get a little bit of emotional energy when I see store displays go up in mid-October, <laughs> that is wrong! <laughs> or hear Christmas music playing before Thanksgiving, it is an abomination. <laughs> it turns out that cultural clashing over Christmas is nothing new in our country. There was a period beginning in the mid-1600s in some of the earliest colonies when laws were actually passed to make the celebration of Christmas illegal and punishable by fines. During this period, laws were passed forbidding businesses and schools from closing on Christmas, and ministers frequently delivered sermons warning parishioners that it was unchristian, and in fact downright sinful, to observe Christmas. As Cotton Mather told his congregation in December of 1712, "'Tis an evident affront unto the grace of God for men to make the birth of our Holy Savior an encouragement and an occasion for unholy enormities." <laughs> Merry Christmas to you as well. And so this morning, I want to talk about, that's all a way of introduction, but this morning I want to talk about the practice of Advent within liturgical Christianity. And I want to just be clear that I do this not because I am saying that this is the correct way to observe the holidays. I'm going to try to suppress that judgmental instinct. Rather, I've chosen this topic out of curiosity, and out of wondering whether and how the spiritual lessons of Advent season might speak to us as Unitarian Universalists. Advent is most observed in the liturgical Christian tradition. When I say liturgical Christianity, I'm referring mainly to Episcopalian, Anglican, Catholic, and Orthodox churches. Advent refers to the period from the fourth Sunday before Christmas, which is today, all the way up to midnight on December 24th. And in these traditions, Advent is not the Christmas season. Advent is not the Christmas season, but a separate season preceding Christmas. During Advent, the church is, in these traditions, are, is decorated in purple or dark blue, not red and green and gold. The singing of Christmas hymns is prohibited in church during Advent. 
And people who grow up in the liturgical Christian tradition often tell stories of not putting up their Christmas tree or Christmas decorations until after services on Christmas Eve. Now, did anyone grow up in one of those traditions where you didn't put up until after service on Christmas Eve? Yeah. And in fact, the 12 days of Christmas don't refer to the time we're in right now, but the 12 days after Christmas, the period between Christmas and Epiphany. Now, of course, you probably have a friend who is Catholic. You may know someone who is Episcopalian, and you may have noticed that this person has put up a tree in their house, did wear a festive sweater around the office, did make you Christmas cookies. That does not make this person a bad Episcopalian or a bad Catholic. We live in a culture that's dominated by both Protestantism and capitalism, and Protestantism, in its most pure form, is suspicious, resists the idea of emotional highs and lows, and so tends to downplay seasons like Advent and Lent. And capitalism, well, capitalism understands that celebration and indulgence are more profitable than self-denial. <laughs> One thing, though, to talk about what liturgical Christians are not supposed to do during Advent, and these strictures are generally loosening as the dominant culture subsumes the traditional. But the whole point of Advent is not about what you're not supposed to do. The whole point is the practice. Advent is practiced as a period of anticipation, expectation, and waiting. It is as my friend and workout buddy and local actor Ray Dooley puts it, a period of prayerful preparation. Last Monday, Ray, was, and we were both at the gym together, and Ray asked me, I said, Tom, what are you preaching on this week? I said, well, I'm, I'm preaching on Advent to a congregation where Advent really is a practice. And Ray goes, ah, Advent. Prayerful preparation. He's, he's a Episcopalian. And that's, and that's what it is. It's a time of intentional reflection. It's a time, perhaps, for contemplating the text of the first chapter of Luke, in which the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah, in which Elizabeth conceives a child, in which the angel then appears to Mary, and Mary and Elizabeth meet under the most unlikely of circumstances. It's a time of reflection. Reflection on the journey of Mary and Joseph as they set out together for Bethlehem. It is a time for preparation, to contemplate, to prepare oneself for how to be able to welcome hope, peace, love, and joy into our hearts as qualities that we welcome into us in our living. It's a time of inner preparation. The mood of Advent is one of calmness, stillness, anticipation, expectation. And it's also a time of seriousness, a time of willingness to be in the dark. I went looking for some contemporary voices writing about what Advent means. Um, and I decided to actually include something which I never include, which is I decided to just Google what is the mood of Advent. And and I'll give you the first three things that came up. Um, and it's funny because they're all different. So here are the top three results. And I don't vouch for any of them, but you can see it's just a, just a sample of different ways that people try to make sense out of the season. The first thing that popped up was a reflection by a guy who calls himself Internet Monk, or I Monk. <laughs> and he says, the mood of Advent is dark and serious. It's the mood of darkness that comes because the world is in darkness. This is the time that we stop and see that the powers of evil are entrenched in the world. A good creation is being ruined. Hearts made for love and light are imprisoned, crying out and empty. And Advent is the season of recognizing this. The second passage that came up was from Gentle Spirit Christian Church. 
which seems like a lovely name for a church. And they endorse what they call Advent attitudes of attentiveness, joyful anticipation, patience, and receptivity. They say, if God is coming to us and we truly believe that to be true, our mood will be one of excitement, anticipation, and joyful preparation. So you have embrace of darkness, and you've got joyful preparation. And then the third post I came across was actually defeat and resignation. <laughs> it was a priest, and he is complaining. Every December, we priests fight the good fight. We try to guide our people towards an observance of Advent. However, in the circumstance in which we live, the weeks preceding Christmas usually are not at all accommodating for what should be the mood of Advent. Instead, people will approach it as a busy time of buying presents and having parties. All hope is lost. <laughs> Which I thought, I thought the three were good to share. I'm not sure I agree with any of them, but um, you can see how people approach this time of the year. And so what I'd like to do, instead of report, is to reflect on two aspects of Advent that I find interesting, challenging, and perhaps appropriate for us as Unitarian Universalists. The first aspect of Advent that I want to emphasize is that of finding stillness, finding stillness and peace in the midst of chaos, in the midst of busyness and a million things pulling us in a million directions. There's an old Unitarian reading for the season that I quite like. It's called Too Full or Fulfilled. And I share it with you. How full was the inn at Bethlehem? Too full. How full are our lives? Are our lives too full? Are we too full of activities to have room for family? Are we too full of responsibilities to have room for simple joys? Are we too full of busyness to have room for thought? Are we too full of self-interest to have room for common needs? Too full of regrets to have room for hope? Are we too full of fear to have room for faith? Are we too full of suspicion to have room for love? Are we too full of conflict to have room for peace and goodwill? Are we too full of noise to have room for the angel choirs? Make room, clear away the debris, open the doors of your heart. The things that matter will not clutter and crowd your life. The things that matter will enlarge the orbit of your being until you are large enough to contain all that is worthy of being welcomed. So that first aspect of Advent that I resonate with is that idea of finding stillness, time for introspection, to wonder what it is that our lives are being filled up with and whether we might make room, make room for that which deserves it. So that first aspect is stillness, introspection, making room. And the second aspect of Advent that I find both attractive and also challenging is the idea of waiting as a spiritual practice. I spoke with someone who observed Advent growing up, and she reflected on how practicing delayed gratification, waiting to decorate, waiting to sing, waiting to celebrate, waiting for presents, actually made the eventual arrival of those things much sweeter. And it occurs to me that it's true we live in an on-demand culture in which you can get it now, download it, have Amazon send it to your doorstep the next day. We don't like to wait. But I don't want to make this about waiting for presents. And so I pondered. I pondered whether there might be an aspect of waiting as a spiritual practice that we might embrace. So as I pondered that, my first answer to that was, was no. What popped into my mind was something Martin Luther King wrote in his 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail, where he was sharply critical of those who told him to practice patience. 
For years now, I have heard the word wait, but you cannot set a timetable for another person's freedom. Justice delayed is justice denied. In fact, King's next book, published in 1964, was called Why We Cannot Wait. And so I've reflected, and it does seem that there is a kind of waiting that is harmful. But I wonder if there's also, I wonder if there's also a kind of waiting that is enriching. There's this phrase that I came across while preparing this sermon. The phrase was, the weight of the weight. The weight of the weight, and it's spelled this way. That's the W-E-I-G-H-T, the weight of the W-A-I-T, the weight of the weight. As in, who carries the weight of the weight. I found this phrase in a reflection that was written about Mary, the mother of Jesus. It was written that Mary on the road to Bethlehem carries the weight of the weight, like literally, the weight, the baby of the weight. And probably, I feel that we connect with the spirit of Advent most when we find ourselves in the practice of waiting in solidarity with, in relationship with, in accountability to, in partnership with, at one with anyone who is carrying the weight of the weight. Think of people who may be waiting for test results or that appointment with a doctor. Those who are waiting for the resolution of a difficult challenge. I think of visits to those who are imprisoned. I had a visit two weeks ago, but I'm still processing that there was that there was a weight to that weight. Between the service as a member of the church who is a pen pal with someone on death row, says that she resonated with that phrase, the weight of the weight. I think of those waiting for justice. A member of the church sent me a story this week about how in the Netherlands a church has taken an Armenian refugee facing deportation in and how there's a law in the Netherlands that police may not enter a church during a worship service, so that this church has held worship nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for more than a month. And ministers sign up to take a shift for an hour, and choirs sign up to take a shift for an hour. And then, oh, we'll talk about the weight of the weight. So one aspect of Advent that I resonate with is that idea of perhaps finding stillness, the ability to make space for what is worthy of filling our lives. And the other aspect is one of waiting, not telling somebody else that they ought to wait, but actually waiting ourselves, waiting with those who in our world are waiting for a new justice, a new hope, a new peace, new news. Waiting with, and I think that if you are waiting with, you're somehow living that spirit of Advent. We're going to sing a hymn, we're going to close with a hymn about making space and a hymn about the waiting of this season. The choir sang it wonderfully, and now it's our chance to say, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And as we move towards the end of our service, I invite you to rise in body and spirit as we sing.